Hello everyone, this is going to be a review video dealing mostly with Andrew Jackson and his presidency and his, ultimately his influence on the American political system, but it's also going to kind of be dealing a little bit with the beginning of America's expansion westward. In 1820, we are going to have passing what is called the Missouri Compromise, and what the Missouri Compromise was is actually when you have Missouri applying for statehood in 1819, there, there's a bit of an issue with its application. Uh, and the real reason comes down to the number of states in the Union, in the country, uh, that are slave and non-slave. And the problem was is that there were an equal number of states at the time. And there were actually 11 slave states and 11 free states. And ultimately, the admission of this additional state is going to tip the balance in the favor of one of them. Remember, we're, we're really worried here about the amount of representation that these states are going to have in Congress, in particular in the Senate where things would otherwise be equal at the time. So really this is going to become more of an issue over the economic systems in the North versus the South, and you know both of these groups are really going to be looking to spread their way of life into new territories as the United States expanded westward. The North, you know, had begun this kind of transition uh, more toward an industrial economy. Uh, we're not seeing large-scale industry yet, uh, but we are going to be starting to get gain wage wage workers and sharecroppers and things like that. Um, you know, stepping away from people owning their own farms, and in the South, you're going to have the the large-scale plantations that we we've already talked about. And in addition to that, sharecroppers and, and things working on those those particular farms. So not everyone in the South is going to own own their own you know, farm for their own agriculture, but it really is going to come down to kind of this transition. The North is stepping away from that, and the South is really looking to continue to fully embrace that ideal in in the style of you know, Thomas Jefferson and his his ideals. So these two different systems are really going to clash, and you're going to get what's called sectionalism growing as a result. And sectionalism is really just an exaggerated loyalty to a particular region of the country. So in this case, you know, many of the northerners are, are really looking, you know, to to maintain the power in the north, obviously, and, and their way of life, and in the south is looking to do the same. This is going to be a, a bit of a debate and in Congress, what you're going to have is this man named Henry Clay actually propose to kind of keep the balance in Congress. So the idea is that they're going to, yes, Missouri will come into the state, the nation, sorry, as a free state. So ultimately what is decided is that you're going to have this man named Henry Clay proposing this idea of this compromise. And the idea is that Yes, Missouri is going to come into the Union as a slave state, but this is only going to happen if the North gets to maintain this balance and that they're going to now also bring in the state of Maine into in the United States. And this is going to maintain that balance in Congress, again, in particular in the Senate. And ultimately, they're also going to decide that this is... They're going to try to settle this once and for all. They're going to create this, this line at... 36 degrees and 30 minutes north latitude. And the idea is that any states that are now coming into the Union above this line are going to be free states, and any states that are coming in below this line are going to be slave states. And this actually did work for a bit. It did kind of bring a, a bit of a lull into this bitter debate, but it's only going to last for so long as we're going to be kind of talking about as, as we move forward here. And that this debate is going to kind of really, really ramp up um, more as we get closer to the Civil War. As you can see here on the map uh, for the Missouri Compromise in 1820, you can really see how this it makes this line and how that line, you know, should it extend farther westward, uh, and how that might ultimately become a problem for the United States. In fact, Thomas Jefferson, when he is talking about the Missouri Compromise not that long after the fact, he is quoted as saying that he believes this to be the death knell of the Union. And what 
I guess he's referring to here is that you know if you look at this line kind of where my mouse is going and extend that farther and and with knowledge of where you know the United States borders are ultimately going to end this is really going to leave a lot more territory to the north than to the south and that leaves a lot more room for expansion of states above the line than below the line but for, for right now, uh, it's going to kind of settle this debate. Uh, you had 11 states free and slave, and now with the addition of Missouri and Maine, so Missouri right here and Maine up here, uh, you are now going to have 12 states of each, and it's going to maintain that balance in Congress, which is what they were looking for. Knowing what we know about the dissolving of the Federalists after the War of 1812 and, and James Madison, uh, you know, the party being fractured, you're actually going to get uh, the election of President James Monroe in 1816. And he's going to kind of win with a landslide of about 80% of the electoral vote. Uh, he's really going to become the last president of the kind of the original political parties that we had talked about. But James Monroe, he, uh, you know, he comes in and does some pretty good things. Uh, for starters, he he actually buys Florida from Spain, um, which is going to kind of help to ease some of these tensions between the, the parties at the time. He's going to kind of uh, go around the country as well. And this, this tour, it's going to be pretty well received. And ultimately, he is going to, with the help of the Secretary of State at the time, John Quincy Adams, who is going to become uh, the president in not so long into the future, uh, he's going to really kind of help extend American influence from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean, really giving... Uh, the Americans some kind of fishing rights in the Pacific Northwest and just some rights up in the Oregon uh, Territory. So another thing that James Monroe is responsible for is this Monroe Doctrine, and this is probably one of the things that you know, his presidency is the most famous for. And what this is is really a political statement by James Monroe at the time in 1823, really worried in particular about European power uh, coming over into the Western Hemisphere in particular, uh, and European powers in particular in South America, and really how their proximity to the United States. You know, these these European countries have colonies in in the southern South America, and they really there's a little too close for comfort for James Monroe. And in his statement, he more or less says that Europe is no longer able to interfere with current states or territories in the Americas in the Western Hemisphere, and that Europe would no longer be able to create any new territories in the Americas, and that the ones that they have now in particular are sort of grandfathered, but any additional movement in, in these uh, in the Western Hemisphere, then the United States can essentially view this as an act of war, and should they feel necessary, they they can actually go to war over this and, and fight the European powers over it. And the U.S. is basically saying to the Europeans that if, if you stay out of our affairs here in the Western Hemisphere, then ultimately we will stay out of your affairs over in Europe. Here you can see a political cartoon from the time period. Uh, you know, I can zoom in a little bit in spot to spot, but on the bottom you can see, you know, keep off the Monroe Doctrine must be respected, if you can read that down there on the bottom. And what you see here, uh, you know, this this ocean, uh, if you will, this river in between is representing the, the gulf, uh, the ocean uh, in between the western and eastern hemisphere. Uh, you have this no trespass, right? America for Americans, you know, sincerely uh, Uncle Sam, and he's protecting these South American and Central American countries. You have Venezuela here, Nicaragua, I'm not sure who this is supposed to represent back here, but you can tell that all of these different countries, people over here are dressed stereotypically in the garb of their countries. You can see uh, this guy representing Portugal, this person representing France and Spain uh, and Germany on the hat here. So you can really see that this, this cartoon is meant to represent the, the actions of the Monroe Doctrine and what it is supposed to be representing. By 1824, you're really only going to have one political party remaining after the kind of demise of the Federalists, and this is going to be the Democratic Republicans, the Republicans that had, you know, really matched up with Jeffersonian ideals. And what you're going to get is kind of these four different people running for president, and not all of them are actually going to be backed by the party in particular, and some of them are going to be backed 
by their own state. Uh, and the list that you have here is going to actually be Andrew Jackson uh, representing Tennessee, a guy named Henry Clay representing Kentucky. You're going to have John Quincy Adams representing Massachusetts. And then you're actually going to have the actual party candidate, a man named William H. Crawford. So this gets a little complicated. Uh, which, what's going to happen is that Andrew Jackson is actually going to win the electoral votes, but because of the four candidates in the, in the contest, you're not going to actually have a majority in, in the win and not going to actually get the number of electoral votes necessary to become the president. And when that happens, what, what is necessary is that the decision is actually made in the House of Representatives. So you're going to get this famous instance that's known as the corrupt bargain. And what actually happens is that John Quincy Adams works together with Henry Clay, uh, Quincy Adams being you know, a close second to Jackson here, uh, more or less convinces, convinces Henry Clay, who I, you know, is, is dead last in this race, to basically have all of his supporters uh, you know, back him in the House of Representatives, and by doing so, then Henry Clay will be chosen as the Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams, and by making this bargain, basically, you're going to have John Quincy Adams being chosen by the House of Representatives to become the president over Andrew Jackson, even though he had received more votes. On this map, you can actually see the difference in, in the votes. So if you look at the, uh, the green as Andrew Jackson, you can actually see that he received more popular votes and electoral votes. But when you look on the next map, you're actually going to see that John Quincy Adams is actually chosen in the House of Representatives after this, this famous corrupt bargain. And that is how John Quincy Adams gets elected the President of the United States. So John Quincy Adams became the sixth President of the United States. Uh, John Quincy Adams was really well known at this time as a statesman. He was actually the Secretary of State under James Monroe. He had drafted a number of treaties. He actually had drafted the Monroe Doctrine, uh, the Treaty of Ghent from the War of 1812, if you remember that, uh, and also wrote the, the deal with Spain to, to purchase Florida. So when he came in as president, uh, mostly as a result of the issues that it just had with this corrupt bargain, he's going to really run into a lot of problems with Andrew Jackson's followers and, and people that supported Andrew Jackson in Congress. Uh, he's going to really have, really face this unwilling Congress who really wanted less government and, and wanted Jackson as the president. And ultimately, he's going to really run, you know, against this popular opinion at the time. Uh, and he was going to look to advocate for having the federal government really helping to direct the economic policy of the United States through uh, a national bank. Um, he wanted to encourage high tariffs to encourage basically this growth of factories. And also, he really looked to expand the internal, expand internal improvements in the country by building roads and canals and, and things like that to really help expansion westward. And one of the big canals that he is famous for having started is a canal between the Delaware River and the Chesapeake Bay on the eastern coast. So. Unfortunately uh, for him, he is going to become a one-term president as a result of, of the issues that he faced mostly in Congress with the people that were against him. But he was able to do a lot in that one, the, you know, that one term. So in the election of 1828, you're going to have the election of Andrew Jackson uh, against John Quincy Adams. And as we know, Andrew Jackson is going to actually be the winner this time around. But what you're really going to have is kind of the, the a split now. You're going to have this kind of now second time period of political parties in the United States. And Andrew Jackson is going to kind of remain as, as this Democratic Republican, but they're going to kind of drop the, the part of Republicans and simply just become known as Democrats. And you're then going to have this, this new party uh, led by John Quincy Adams and, you know, wanting wanting to push through and continue with the, the process that he had made, uh, the progress that he had made. And ultimately, you're going to have the founding of this group known as the National Republicans. 
And they're going to really be pushing and looking for you know, the stronger central government, you know, supporting you know, federal measures, such as road building and you know, the, the federal bank, which we had kind of just talked about. And Jackson is kind of kind of be more this small government uh, group that we, you know, would be seeing going forward. So this gets a little ugly. Uh, you know, you're going to have this kind of mudslinging between the two, and mudslinging is an attempt to kind of ruin their opponent's reputation with insolence, in, insults. Andrew Jackson is reported to have said that, you know, he can, he's a fighter, while John Quincy Adams is a writer, you know, looking to rile up the masses to vote for him because you're going to really kind of have campaigning happening at this point. And Andrew Jackson is going to win, you know, by a relatively large margin this time around, but this time with support of these new frontier states that are joining the fray. So what's going to happen here is that you're going to have new voters that are going to change the way the election landscape is going to to be from here on out. So between 1824 and 1828, you're actually going to have now the allowing of non-property owners to gain suffrage, which is the right to vote. And you're going to have this ma major spike be of voters between 1824 and 1828 because of that. And these people are, are kind of your, your everyday person, right? They're your sharecroppers, they're your factory workers. Uh, they're going to be brought into politics. You know, these are not rich people. These are kind of your, your average, average Joe on some level at the time period. And Andrew Jackson is going to be kind of running as the people's champion. Uh, you know, he is a self-made man. Uh, he essentially was a general um, from a relatively modest upbringing down in the South in Tennessee. And that's everything that John Quincy Adams was not, right? He's the son of a president and he you know, is from a well-to-do family, obviously. But the, the people that are now kind of entering the election process are going to be looking for someone more like themselves. And that's what they see in Andrew Jackson. And this is actually pretty incredible. Uh, looking at this graph, you can see between you know 1824 and 1840, you're going to have almost you know this huge jump uh, be, be of voters, of potential voters, right, of about 26.9%. Um, you know, moving up, you know, to about almost 57% uh, of voter turnout in for the 1832, you know, 1828 election, sorry. And then by 1840, you're going to have almost 80% participation of white males voting, which is pretty incredible if you think about it when you compare it with numbers uh, today. And this rapid expansion of democracy is going to allow Andrew Jackson to be this elected person, right? He, as I just said, he's this self-made man. He's a war hero. He... Uh, you know, gets large crowds of people interested in him, uh, you know, your ordinary farmers, you know, people, these people are at his inauguration. Uh, he gets this, this nickname as Old Hickory on the campaign trail, and as he's tough as this, an old hickory stick. And your small farmers are going to love his success story, and they're going to vote for him and support him throughout his presidency. Andrew Jackson's presidency is going to be pretty controversial. And one of the, the first things that kind of starts this controversy up is going to become known as the spoils system. And you can see, you know, on this political cartoon right here on this plaque in the front of the, the statue that's meant to represent Andrew Jackson, you know, to the victor belong the spoils. So what the spoil system was is that Andrew Jackson, coming from where he did, is ultimately feeling that, you know, it's possible for non-elected officials to be able to handle government jobs. And Andrew Jackson is actually going to kind of get around to firing a number of federal workers. This, this isn't representatives. These, these aren't representatives. They're not people that have been elected necessarily as far as you know, House representative members or Senate members, but other, other positions. And he's going to basically replace them with his supporters and people that have helped him and supported him along the way to his presidency you are also going to get what becomes known as this, this tariff debate and nullification crisis. And in 1828, you're going to have Congress passing a, a, a very high tariff on manufactured goods from Europe in particular. And this is going to be absolutely loved by the Northerners because it's going to really push this North 
you know, Eastern manufacturing, uh, and you're going to have you know these people that are not really affected by this because they just ma manufacture their own goods. But the people in the South, this is going to increase prices for them on goods pretty much all around, and they're going to actually call it uh, a tariff of abominations, and they're going to be really heated about this and really frustrated about it, and you're going to have uh, this man named John C. Calhoun arguing that the states have this right to nullify the laws in any federal law that goes against the, the state interests. And if you remember, this is in a, a situation that's already popped up before, and this type of debate is going to kind of continue to, to push those tensions between the North and the South. And John C. Calhoun's argument is that you're going to have this, you know, since the federal government is ultimately the creation of the states, then the states are the final authority on the constitutional constitutionality of all federal laws. So this turns into a full crisis. Uh, ultimately, Andrew Jackson is going to side with the country and this one uh, and on nullification ultimately and the anger in the the south is going to kind of continuously build uh, and you're going to kind of have these tensions that are are continuously building and growing all the way up to the civil war and you have it you know these pressure building up and, and ultimately some steam gets let off and uh, ultimately keeps building up and building up more i kind of i explained it uh, in class as this kind of teapot that just kind of you keep getting this this increase in, in pressure until you know it ultimately screams and Congress is actually going to pass a lower tariff attempting to ease the tension but South Carolina is going to be annoyed anyway and they're going to pass what's called the Nullification Act and they're going to declare it illegal uh, that they're not going to pay these tariffs uh, 1828 and 1832 and Andrew Jackson is actually going to be forced, or at least in the way he sees it, to to use force on, on South Carolina. And he's actually going to send the military down into South Carolina to actually enforce this this act of Congress, uh, which is, comes known as the Force Bill. And this is, uh, you know, one of these pretty controversial things uh, of Jackson's presidency. During Andrew Jackson's presidency, you're also going to get his war on the Bank of the United States. And Andrew Jackson's argument is that the bank was actually run by private bankers, and it was not elected officials that were, you know, was running this this bank, uh, even though you know the bank had had received its charter through Congress, and that he attacks it for really having a lot of power over your ordinary citizen, and he really gets this feud ends up happening uh, in particular between the president of the bank, whose name is Nicholas Biddle, who was from a you know wealthy New England uh, family, and there's going to be kind of this 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 debate now of whether or not to to maintain this this bank of the United States, and you're going to have some support obviously on on both sides, so. The charter was going to be up in a, a few years, and the the thought of these people, in particular Henry Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, and Nicholas Biddle, was to introduce a bill to kind of extend this charter. And Andrew Jackson, because of, of his his beliefs, he actually vetoes this charter. Uh, doesn't let this charter, doesn't let this bill, you know, get passed, and doesn't let the charter renew. And Ultimately, this is really frustrating for these people that are pushing it, and they actually f see this as a, a show of weakness from Jackson. They actually believe that uh, his stance on this is something that you know the, the people of the United States uh, might might feel is not good, and they're actually going to push Henry Clay for running for president in, in the re-election year. Here you can see a quote by Andrew Jackson. Uh, he says, When laws make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society, the farmers, mechanics, and laborers, who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves, have a right to complain of the injustice of the government. So this just kind of really exemplifies him acting as this this authority for the people and why these people really seem to to like him and his his actions as president so the initial veto on the charter uh, doesn't 
have the effect that Henry Clay wanted. And Andrew Jackson is actually still going to be reelected by a large margin in 1832 uh, under this role as kind of the people's people's champion. And once Andrew Jackson is actually reelected, uh, he's going to essentially kill the, the Bank of the United States. For starters, he's going to withdraw all of the government deposits from the, the federal bank, the national bank, and essentially put all of this money in what it becomes known as pet banks. And these are state banks where Jackson is going to place this federal money. And these banks are typically run by his friends, uh, his supporters, and people that you know support his economic policies. And this is kind of a, just a clear example of that spoils system uh, coming back uh, into play here. And Andrew Jackson is going to continue to let this charter ultimately die in 1836 when he doesn't renew it for operation, which would have been necessary. And ultimately, the second bank of the United States is forced to close as a result. Another aspect of Andrew Jackson that leads to a lot of controversy about his presidency is his policy on Native Americans. For starters, you know, as you remember, Andrew Jackson is known for killing Native Americans. Uh, you have the, the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, which he you know, became famous in, and obviously he also became famous in, in the Battle of New Orleans with the War of 1812, uh, not necessarily dealing with Native Americans there, but you know, his dislike and kind of racial attitudes towards Native Americans is going to really lead to mistreatment of the Native Americans on some level. And he is going to push Indian removal with the Indian Removal Act, which is going to essentially push out the five southern tribes and send them west of the Mississippi River uh, to make room for expanding white American settlers. The five southern tribes at the time were the Chickasaws, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, the Seminole, and the Creek Natives. So the one that we're going to really concentrate on here, but that's not because the other stories aren't just as interesting, but the Cherokee in particular, they are, are known here mostly because they in particular are actually going to on some level adopt American values and then look to assimilate uh, in order to be accepted. This is kind of what their leaders, uh, people named Major Ridge and John Ridge, his son, and this other a man named John Ross, who's going to be a big advocate for the Cherokee, uh, that they feel that ultimately it's important for these people to kind of embrace the, the white culture as it's expanding. Otherwise, they are going to be mistreated because they've seen everything else happen to the Native Americans. And you're going to get this kind of thing that becomes known as the Cherokee Renaissance, where the Cherokee go through this time period where they adopt an actual constitution, which is actually pretty similar to the, the American constitution. Uh, they're going to, many of them are going to kind of adopt American clothing and, and dress, uh, many certain ideas. Uh, you're going to have the establishment of, of a written language for the Cherokee, whereas before it was only just spoken. Uh, you're going to get newspapers and things being printed in this written language. And there's actually going to be an effort to establish actual borders of their, their land, their national borders. Here on this map, you can see the extent of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, this is Cherokee territory, you know, at the time period. And you can see, for the most part, it, it really encompasses a, a good amount of land in, in the United States, uh, surrounded, obviously, by, you know, the rest of the the United States at the time, but this is kind of a, a nation within a nation, and you can see that you know in Georgia, in the Carolinas, some in Virginia, West Virginia, Tennessee, Alabama, you know much of this this really fertile land in the Appalachian Mountains and the surrounding areas uh, was considered Cherokee at the time, and this is land that they obviously really did not want to give up because it, of their their own culture being, you know, having come from there, and, and it's just, it's very, very good land. Knowing that the land that the Cherokee were sitting on was ex exceptionally fruitful, uh, many members of the state of Georgia actually really wanted to, to get some of this land. Uh, obviously, the settlers in, in general, uh, you know, were looking for were farmland, uh, profitable farmland. Uh, there was actually discovery of gold as, as well, which is going to kind of bring settlers illegally into the land. And ultimately, the state of Georgia is going to, want this land in particular, and there's going to be a major dispute, uh, actually, that's the Cherokee are going to bring on the court level uh, in a, a case 
known as Worcester versus Georgia. And this case is actually going to work its way all the way up the courts. And it's going to bring itself all the way to the Supreme Court. And in a very famous Supreme Court ruling, Chief Justice John Marshall makes makes the decision, and I'm going to read you a piece right here, that the Cherokee Nation then is a distinct community, community occupying its own territory with boundaries accurately described in which the laws of Georgia can have no force and which the citizens of Georgia have no right to enter but with the assent of the Cherokees themselves or in conformity with the treaties and with the acts of Congress. So this is a really, really big deal. Uh, you know, John Marshall and the Supreme Court basically ruled that the Cherokee Nation is a sovereign nation within the United States, and that they have all of these rights. And this is this the Cherokee in particular at the time are you know ecstatic about this ruling, but the state of Georgia and Andrew Jackson more or less completely ignores the the decision made by the Supreme Court. And Andrew Jackson's actually reportedly quoted as saying, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. And, you know, it's pretty questionable whether or not he actually said those exact words. But obviously his actions more or less show that he does ignore the, this, this order. And ultimately, under the Indian Removal Bill, uh, you're going to have a number of select Cherokee member, members uh, basically sign away a, a good amount of the Cherokee land uh, and basically do this under what's known as the Treaty of New Echota. And they, their thoughts, uh, which is the Ridges at this point, Major Ridge and his son John Ridge, uh, their thought is that the Cherokee need to get the best deal possible that they're going to get. And that the longer this drags out, that the American government is more or less going to continue to, to not favor them. And that by taking the money that they can now, they can avoid a lot of heartbreak later. And many of the Cherokee, uh, in particular, about 16,000 or so, are going to remain, remain back. They're going to refuse to leave uh, to continue this fight with the American government. And under John Ridge, uh, sorry, John Ross, uh, they are essentially going to be forced off of their land by the American government. Uh, the United States military is going to force march a number, you know, all of the, these people uh, west to the land that had been cordoned for them in Oklahoma. Uh, you're going to have, you know, 16,000 or so making the trip. You're going to have roughly a quarter of them dying on this trip from a number of different things, right? Exposure to the elements. They're, they're doing this in, in the late fall and going into the, into the winter. Um, they're going to have lack of, of cold supplies and provisions to get them through, diseases and other things. And the, the, the Cherokee are going to be, you know, this is a really horrible thing that is going on. And it becomes known as the Trail of Tears. And one thing that's important to understand is that this Trail of Tears isn't when when you use that language. It's not necessarily referring just to the Cherokee in particular, but it's referring to really all of these tribes and all of these groups in the South, the the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek, and Seminoles that are being pushed out of their land for because of the Indian removal, and ultimately pushed into Oklahoma. And you know a number of these tribes experience many of the same conditions that the Cherokee do on, on their trips and they're ultimately, you know, suffer greatly as well. So having this discussion now of Andrew Jackson's presidency, you know, he really gets this title. Uh, he becomes kind of gets this nickname of, of King Andrew uh, because of all of the things that he he's done as president uh, and really kind of marching to his own drum and, and not taking no for an answer in many cases. And there's this really great political cartoon kind of illustrating this. You know, he's standing on top of the Constitution of the United States. You can see right here, right? Uh, King Andrew the uh, first, you know, using this veto um, to, to kind of get things that he wants or not allow things that he doesn't want through through Congress. Uh, and it, it just really, this this picture, this cartoon really illustrates that disdain for Andrew Jackson and on some level the tyrannical powers that he, he wielded on uh, during his presidency. At least that's the argument of, of these people, for sure. 
as a result of Andrew Jackson's economic policies, uh, not only being the only reason, however, uh, you're going to get this panic of 1837. And this is going to really hurt uh, Martin Van Buren, who kind of comes in and wins the presidency in 1836 against this, this new party known as the Whigs. And the party, sorry, the country really dives into this, this economic depression that's going to last really into the middle of the 1840s. It's going to really hurt uh, Van Buren's presidency. Uh, you know, during the time, basically land value is going to drop very sharply. Investments from all over the place are going to decline. Many banks are going to fail. Businesses are going to fail. Uh, farmers and such are, are really going to you know, plunge into debt and lose their land. There's this kind of laissez-faire economic policy uh, that had been happening that really set the stage for a lot of this collapse. So on the end of all of those problems that Martin Van Buren you know, came into as president, you're going to have this rise of this new party known as the Whigs. And you're going to have William Henry Harrison, if you remember that name, uh, from his being governor of Ohio and his dealing with uh, Tecumseh. And he runs with this man named John Tyler against Van Buren for the presidency. And you're going to get this song, uh, basically, and this slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. So if you remember, you know, William Henry Harrison had won this battle of Tippecanoe uh, you know, before the War of 1812. And they were really looking to prove that they were essentially a party for the people. They looked to kind of steal away these Southern votes that had voted for, you know, Andrew Jackson uh, and, and Martin Van Buren, uh, they adopted this log cabin as their symbol. Uh, they, they led a smear campaign against Martin Van Buren, calling him King Martin and, and basically blaming him for all of the economic troubles that were, were going on in the country. So they are actually successful, and William Henry Harrison is elected handedly, defeating Martin Van Buren. Um, I guess the country you know, had gotten really f fed up with, with the Depression, and we're really looking for some help there. And he's inaugurated in 1841, and he delivers this really long speech out, uh, out you know, in Washington, D.C. during his inauguration, out in the rain and cold. And essentially, he catches pneumonia and dies very quickly into his presidency. So as the first time ever when the vice president's going to actually become the president because the president dies in office, John Tyler is going to become the president. And Tyler had once kind of been a Democrat. Uh, so there was kind of this lack of party loyalty and you know, the Whigs in particular didn't really, they hadn't really elected John Tyler, they had elected William Henry Harrison, and he, John Tyler was just on the ticket. So Tyler was kind of a little bit different than, than the classic Whig platform, and as a result, he's going to kind of stop some of the bills that are sponsored by Whigs in Congress. They're going to essentially kick him out of the party, and he's, you know, going to resign positions as a result of that, and there's going to be some major tension between this Whig party and John Tyler as president. So the Whigs had kind of had this meteoric rise uh, to, to gaining the presidency in just a very short period of time as this new party, uh, but with John Tyler, these party goals are going to really become kind of unclear. You know, these people, these Whigs start voting sectionally more than with party unity, you know, the differences between Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs and Western Whigs. You're going to have Henry Clay as their candidate in 1844, but he is going to kind of lose this election to James K. Polk, and really only after four years uh, you know, of serving as the president, the Whigs are going to be out of power just like that. So that is all for this bit uh, on the Jacksonian era and his influence on American politics and the little bit about American expansion, and we will continue on next time. So thank you and have a good one.